Years after the war when talking about April 3, 1945, Staff Sergeant Calvin Pal L. Stevens said, A time for reflection on how fortunate I was to survive this situation. That raised the question, why me? Why not one of the men who was killed? This is a question that never seems to have an adequate answer. Very early on the morning of April 3, 1945, the company commander of a company, 263rd Engineers Battalion, 63rd Infantry Division, A-263, Captain John Henry Tunison Jr., met with 1st Lieutenant Donald Johnston the 2nd Platoon Leader, Technical Sergeant William E. Snyder the 2nd Platoon Sergeant, and Staff Sergeant Calvin Cal Stevens. Captain Tunison said he had received orders to have some infantry taken across the stream around noon the next day. Because he never took his men anywhere without it being surveyed first, he would take Sergeant Snyder and Sergeant Stevens to make a reconnaissance of the area. Captain Tunison disagreed. Lieutenant Johnston and Captain Tunison got into a very heated argument, with Lieutenant Johnston being very persistent about surveying beforehand. Captain Tunison said, You will follow my orders or else. Lieutenant Johnston replied, By God, if any of my men are killed due to this stupid decision, they will be on your head and not mine. On the late morning of April 3, 1945, 2nd Platoon, A-263 RD, crossed the Necker River north of Gundelsheim with two two-and-a-half-ton trucks and a jeep. The jeep was leading the convoy with 1st Lieutenant Donald Johnston and his driver. The first truck was being driven by PFC Anthony Tony D. Orsi. Sergeant Stevens was in the middle seat and Sergeant Snyder was in the far passenger seat of the truck. The back of the first truck was loaded with assault boats, which were to be used by 1st Battalion and 2nd Battalion 253rd Infantry Regiment for the crossing of the Jagst River from Aubergreshine to Untergreshine. The second truck was driven by PFC Jesse L. Knowles Jr. and in the passenger seat was PFC Earl Johnson the assistant driver. The back of the truck was loaded with the rest of the men of Sergeant Stevens' squad. 2nd Platoon proceeded southward from their crossing site along the east bank of the Necker River through the narrow streets of Gundelsheim. An unknown lieutenant in the 63rd Infantry Division failed to carry out his order of installing the roadblock at the underpass at Gundelsheim. This failure resulted in 2nd Platoon convoy to continue southward toward the confluence of the Necker River and Jagst Rivers rather than taking the easterly road to Hawksburg. Had Lieutenant Johnston been allowed to conduct his recon he would have most likely still made the wrong turn but he would have seen the aftermath of the ambush on H Company 253rd Infantry. Past the site where the roadblock should have been, on the south side of the city, they soon found themselves miles into enemy territory. They traveled down the road for approximately three miles and came to a small village of 20 or 30 houses. This town was Offeno, Germany. They thought that they would surely find the infantry there. As they slowly made their way through the village the only people they saw were a few elderly German civilians peeking out the windows. Sergeant Snyder looked at Sergeant Stevens and said, I think we are lost. But they could do nothing about it since they were following 1st Lieutenant Donald Johnston's jeep. They continued through Offeno, past a farmhouse with a large shed on the right side of the road, and at this point the road turned to the left at a 45-degree angle. In the distance of roughly half a mile in front of them they saw black smoke rising in the sky. They traveled a quarter of a mile further and saw that the bridge had just been blown up in front of them. The bridge that was destroyed was on the road that led from Offeno, Germany to Jagstfeld, Germany at the Jagst River crossing. Due to 2nd platoon mistake, this caused the 38th SSPGR to blow up the bridge early, because they believed that 2nd Platoon A-263 were the first part of a much larger force. Since they had already ambushed H Company 253rd Infantry that morning they thought it was time to destroy the bridge so that the Americans would not take it. Sergeant Stevens told Sergeant Cinder, We're in trouble. They didn't know it at the time, but they were about 4 miles into the 17th SS battle line. The convoy stopped the trucks and then all hell broke loose. The 3rd Battalion, 38th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 17th SS Division was defending in the area north of the Jagst River and east of the Necker Rivers when 2nd Platoon, A-263 engineers arrived, in the vicinity between Offeno and Jagstfeld, Germany. While 2nd Platoon's column was driving south on the small road in the vicinity of Offeno the 3rd Battalion 38th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment opened fire from about 183 meters away from the column with three machine guns and rifles from the high ground lying southeast of the road. At this time PFC Jesse L. Knowles Jr., the driver, and PFC Earl Johnson, the assistant driver, of the third vehicle were severely wounded. Dismounting from their vehicles immediately, Lieutenant Johnston and his men took cover. Most of the engineers sought out the protection of a deep ditch running next to the road. In the first truck, Sergeant Snyder jumped out of the right side of the truck and ran around the left side of the truck. PFC Orsi, the driver, jumped out the left side of the truck and fell into a ditch. Sergeant Stevens followed PFC Orsi and as Sergeant Stevens hit the running board, he saw that the ditch on the left side was full of men and he told himself, this was no place to stop. Luckily there was a deep ditch on that side of the road, where most of the men were laying. As he saw the circumstances, he jumped across the ditch, ran up a grade and dove over a wire fence, 
not knowing what was on the other side. He ended up rolling down a 10-foot embankment and bouncing off of some railroad tracks at the bottom. At the second truck when the ambush was sprung the most devastating fire hit this vehicle. The men in the back of the truck evacuated as quickly as possible. T-4, Lewis A. Hewish made it to the safety of the deep ditch on the left side of the road, but noticed that some of the men were wounded and unable to take cover. Disregarding his own safety and in full view of the 38 SS PGR, he left his cover and removed the casualties to a place of safety. Also taking place at the second truck it was common practice to have a green camouflage and folded across the hood in front of the windshield. The two men inside the second truck PFC Earl Johnson and PFC Jesse L. Knowles Jr. were wounded so badly they could not get off the truck. In the meantime, the nets caught on fire, making a heavy black smoke screen. Several of the men were able to escape from the ditch due to the black smoke. They were very fortunate in that there was a small stone quarry located near our location. But in a very short period, we could hear PFC Earl Johnson and PFC Jesse Knowles yelling for help. Some of the men wanted to try and save them. But Sergeant Cinder and Lieutenant Johnson thought it would be sure suicide if we returned to the burning trucks. This was an extremely difficult decision, but they had no choice under these circumstances and that was the way it had to be. That decision haunted many of the men for some time. Lieutenant Johnston, his Jeep driver, Sergeant Cinder, and four other men had also made it into the stone quarry. In the protection of a small quarry-like area just north of the Jaxt River, a small contingent found themselves isolated in a concrete culvert which lay beneath a railroad embankment and had been previously used as a latrine by the 38th SS PGR. A third group of engineers took cover in a ditch along the railroad embankment. They were in a dire situation and needed help desperately. Since they were in front of the 7th Army battle line, all of the surviving members of 2nd Platoon felt sure no one knew where they were. Due to Sergeant Stevens' rapid exit from the truck, his rifle had been left on the rack in the truck. PFC John N. Rash had his rifle so Sergeant Stevens told Lieutenant Donald Johnston and Sergeant Snyder that they would go and try to get some help. They thought surely there had to be some GIs in the last village they came through. Come on Rash, you and I are going to get help? Sergeant Stevens said and they made their way up into a field just to the rear of the stone quarry. They immediately were fired upon by the machine guns. They ran in a zigzag fashion with bullets hitting the dirt all around them. Fortunately, the machine guns were far enough away that they couldn't be very accurate. After running about 75 yards, they saw two mounds of dirt in front of them and they dove behind them. Shortly after PF's Rash and Sergeant Stevens got out the Panzer Grenadiers quickly surrounded the remaining men of 2nd Platoon, preventing any movement out of the area. Lieutenant Donald Johnston felt he was entirely responsible for getting his men into the situation that they were in and for the loss of the two men so far. He truly believed that had he been allowed by Captain Tunison to do his three-man reconnaissance before starting on this venture they would not be in this situation that he found his platoon in. Lieutenant Johnston knowing that he had two men attempting to go for help still knew it was in his men's best interest at the moment to attempt to break through the 38th SS lines and try to make it back to the last town. At this point Lieutenant Johnson was able to get his men out of the quarry and into the buildings close by and the platoon continued returning the fire of the enemy. Lieutenant Johnson seeing that he was engaged in a hopeless fight and realizing that the casualties of his platoon were mounting rapidly, Johnston evacuated the wounded men to the cellar of the building which he was occupying with the idea in mind of returning during the night with reinforcements to evacuate them. During this action Lieutenant Johnston was wounded despite his wound he personally saw to that. The wounded were safely placed in the cellar Lieutenant Johnston began leading the remainder of his platoon from the scene of the action by carefully choosing his way around and through the buildings. As he was advancing over a small rise in an attempt to find an exit around the crest of a hill which was under observation of the 38th SS PGR Lieutenant Johnston climbed a set of steps and raised his head up to look for a means of escape. As he did, bullets from a different machine gun than earlier opened fire upon him hitting him in the face and he fell backwards down the steps into the bottom of the quarry, killing him instantly. Upon First Lieutenant Donald Johnston's death, Technical Sergeant William E. Snyder took command of the platoon since he was the platoon sergeant. Sergeant Snyder realized that all avenues were covered by automatic weapons fire forcing him to lead his men back to the houses that had the wounded men from 2nd platoon in them. The men of 2nd platoon defended the houses and hoped that Staff Sergeant Calvin Pal L. Stevens and PFC John N. Rash would be able to get back to them before the 38th SS overran their position. After Sergeant Stevens and PFC Rash up behind mounds of dirt, Sergeant Stevens took off his field jacket so that he could run faster. In his haste he had forgotten that he had his trusted pocket-sized New Testament in the jacket breast pocket. Sergeant Stevens would never see either item again. After shedding the jacket, PFC Rash and Sergeant Stevens crawled down into a gully which led them to a railroad station at the edge of Offenau, Germany. They sat down in the station to catch their breath, but after a few minutes they had to leave. Sergeant Stevens was still thinking that they would find GIs in the village. Then PFC Rash said, Cal, I just can't go any further. PFC Rash was a very nice and brave young man, but never seemed to be able to get into combat shape. It is also important to note that 16 days before this action on March 18, 1945, PFC Rash had earned the Bronze Star Medal for Valor for clearing mines, a task that took three hours while under fire from German artillery and pillbox fire. Sergeant Stevens told PFC Rush to stay there 
and to keep the rifle with him. Then Sergeant Stevens made his way into Afano but found no American soldiers. This was extremely disappointing, and Sergeant Stevens was very scared being unarmed and alone. He slowly made his way along the sidewalk, which was located next to the houses. He kept praying for his safety. He could hear the old wooden shutters creaking and knew someone had to be peeking out at him. He really did not expect to get through the village without being shot. Sergeant Stevens asked God for help on every step I took. As he got to the outskirts of Afano, he began to run back down the road that the convoy had come up earlier. Because he was so exhausted, he had to run 100 yards and then walk 50 yards, again and again. He did this for 5 kilometers slash 3.11 miles from Afano to the underpass at Gundelsheim. Just as he got to the underpass, he saw a jeep with two officers and their driver getting ready to turn up toward the town. Frantically Sergeant Stevens yelled, I need help, my squad has been ambushed. They immediately took him to a large house where the 861st Field Artillery had their headquarters set up. At the 861st Field Artillery Headquarters Sergeant Stevens was taken into a large room with 8 to 10 officers standing around. A lieutenant guided Sergeant Stevens over to a large table with a full bird colonel sitting behind it. On the table was a large map covered with glass. The colonel asked, Sergeant, what's your problem? From the tone of his voice, Sergeant Stevens felt uneasy with him. Sergeant Stevens told him where 2nd Platoon had been ambushed and the colonel said it was impossible to be ambushed there. The colonel said, You show me where we are now and I'll show you where the men are located. Sergeant Stevens pointing to the map and showed the colonel where 2nd platoon had been ambushed, and then the colonel said, Impossible. How the hell did you get down there? The road at the underpass has been blocked off. Sergeant Stevens didn't like the colonel's superior attitude and, being extremely exhausted and worrying about his men, Sergeant Stevens said, The road was not blocked off. How do you think we got there? The colonel then stood up, leaned over the table towards Sergeant Stevens as if to chew him out, and said, How the hell did you get so screwed up? By this time, Sergeant Stevens had had all he could take, and Sergeant Stevens leaned over the table at the colonel and said, I'll be damned if I know. I'm only a club member. What are you going to do about my men? Sergeant Stevens said, at this point he knew better than to push me any further. I was a very dirty, weary, and exhausted soldier worrying about my men and wouldn't take any crap. I was ready for battle, and he knew it. The colonel then told one of the sergeants to get a particular lieutenant, and when the lieutenant appeared, the colonel got up, met him in the middle of the room, and said, You were responsible for putting up the roadblock at the underpass. Did you do it? The lieutenant started to stammer, and the colonel yelled at him. You didn't do it, did you? In response the lieutenant said that he hadn't done as he had been told. The colonel chewed the lieutenant out, and then said, Get the hell out of my sight, I will deal with you later. Then the colonel turned to Sergeant Stevens and said, It is too dangerous to fire artillery into the area without an exact location. Sergeant, take him over to the tank headquarters and get him help. They got into a jeep and rode over to the other side of Gundelsheim. They entered another house which was being used by Company C, 753rd Tank Battalion, C-753 Tank, where there was a captain and some sergeants. They had received some information by radio for the colonel, and from Major Ancher Christensen of 2nd Battalion, 253rd Infantry Regiment, the captain said, I hear you have a problem. Explain it to me and show me on the map. Sergeant Stevens explained the entire situation to him and then he told the other sergeant to get Sergeant Stevens some hot coffee, which he drank while sitting on a narrow stool in a hallway. The captain said, Give us 20 minutes, and we will be ready to go. Within minutes after starting to drink the coffee, Sergeant Stevens fell asleep due to being completely exhausted from the day's ordeal. Stevens fell off the stool onto the floor and got burned with the coffee. In about 30 minutes, the captain came out of his room and said, Let's go. The rescue force was made up of tankers from 2nd Platoon Company C, 753rd Tank Battalion commanded by Lt. William H. Golden, with riflemen from 2nd Battalion, 253rd Infantry Regiment and artillerymen from the 861st Field Artillery, and some medics from the 253rd Medial led by 1st Lt. Donald Kramer the assistant surgeon for 2nd Battalion, 253rd Infantry. The captain and his driver climbed into the front seat of his jeep, while a sergeant, a radio man, and Sergeant Stevens climbed into the back seat. They pulled over in front of two tanks and he waved them to follow. They went down through the town of Gundelsheim, Germany to the underpass and turned left with the two tanks following. After traveling about three miles, they came to Offeno, Germany and slowly went through and started towards the disabled trucks and jeep. At this time Sergeant Stevens was wondering if they were leading the whole way. Sergeant Stevens was getting very uneasy and got ready to jump out of the jeep but as they got beside the shed of the farm on the right side, the captain pulled over and waved the tanks on. The rescue force arrived in about two hours after Sergeant Stevens had alerted the 861st Field Artillery of 2nd Platoon, a slash 263 engineer's plight. When the tanks got near the disabled vehicles, they spun to the right and, while still turning, started to fire at the machine guns. Within 15 minutes there was no more response from the 38th GPR machine guns. Second platoon, a slash 263 engineers were finally relieved at dusk, they had been in a fire fight for 8 hours. Sergeant Snyder started to lead the men out of the house, but Sergeant Stevens didn't see Lieutenant Johnston, so Sergeant Stevens asked where Lieutenant Johnston was. Sergeant Snyder said he had gotten shot and was lying in the bottom of the quarry. The rescue force helped the engineers load the 8 wounded men, including Private Charles C. Wade who was shot in the leg by a machine gun while lying down. 
The bullet traveled up his leg into his abdomen and later developed into peritonitis, an infection of the lining of the abdominal cavity. He died of his wound six days later, April 9, 1945. The other wounded men were Corporal Doyle M. Forsyth, Private Havrilla Joseph, PFC Robert F. Kibler, Private James H. Ralph, PFC Arthur A. Russo, PFC Orville E. Simpson, and PFC Arthur E. Vanover. The three dead men, PFC Earl Johnson, First Lieutenant Donald Johnston, PFC Jesse L. Knowles Jr., they were put onto the tanks and jeeps. One of the men of 2nd Platoon went berserk and they had to tie him onto the hood of a jeep to get him back to the field hospital. He was evacuated as a non-battle casualty due to fatigue. The men of 2nd Platoon did not see him again. The two trucks, the jeep, and the assault boats were all damaged beyond repair due to the ambush and were left behind, according to the 2nd Platoon Sergeant William E. Snyder. When we got back to the battalion command post that night, the battalion commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Cohn, called me into his tent and stated that by all rights he would like to send my platoon on rest and recuperation, but that the battalion had just been committed as infantry and we were needed.